Good morning, Mr. Tucker. Good morning. Uh, we've got Simon and Ben joining us here uh, from Fonterra. We have you here. Uh, we have your written submission in front of us. Thank you very much for providing that. Very useful indeed. We have you in front of the Health Committee for 10 minutes. I will hand that time over to you now. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and to the committee. Good morning. Kia ora tō ato. Uh, great to be here. And thank you for the opportunity to present to the committee today. Uh, we're sorry we can't be here in person on this occasion, uh, but we thought we'd make some brief opening remarks, uh, and then we're very happy to take uh, the committee's questions. My name is Simon Tucker. I'm Group Director of Global External Affairs at Fonterra, and joining me online from different parts of the country are uh, Dr. Jeremy Hill, who is Fonterra's Chief Scientist, uh, and Ben Cunliffe, our Manager of New Zealand Government Affairs in, in Wellington. Fonterra supports modernising New Zealand's gene technology regulations. Liberalisation can unlock innovation in the primary sector and strengthen our international competitiveness. The bill's risk-based framework provides opportunities in the near term to advance local research, particularly around new gene editing techniques, and in the longer term, potentially lift on-farm productivity and deliver sustainability benefits. Other countries are already embracing these new technologies and without modernising our own regulatory framework, New Zealand risks falling behind. Fonterra's support for liberalisation is balanced with the need to retain sensible regulatory safeguards. These safeguards are crucial for maintaining transparency, consumer trust and market confidence. And we recommend several targeted changes to strengthen the bill. These recommendations are not intended to slow down progress or to handicap reform. Rather, they are to ensure primary sector exporters can continue to operate with confidence within the new regulatory framework. We acknowledge the intention to align New Zealand's framework with Australia, but we support a somewhat more nuanced approach which takes into account New Zealand-specific factors. There are two primary reasons for this. Firstly, the Australian regime has not yet encountered the challenges likely to face New Zealand's dairy industry. No gene technologies are yet used commercially at scale in Australia's dairy industry. Secondly, the relative size of the two countries' dairy industries differ significantly. Dairy accounts for 25% of New Zealand's goods exports, compared with 0.5% of Australian exports. We believe that with several changes to account for specific factors relevant to New Zealand, the Gene Technology Bill will be a positive step forward for innovation in the country's primary industries. And I'll now just pass to Ben, who will walk through our recommended changes in a little more detail. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Simon. I'll just go through our recommended changes uh, very quickly. Um, we recommend making three changes to the bill. Firstly, we propose explicitly incorporating consideration of trade and market access risks into the regulatory framework. This will allow the new regulator to consider potential market implications when evaluating the level of risk associated with new organisms and what conditions may be appropriate prior to the release of those organisms in New Zealand. New Zealand's main dairy export markets generally require labelling for products derived from genetically modified animals. So we believe it's appropriate for the regulator to consider what record keeping or disclosure requirements may be necessary in a scenario where GM is present in New Zealand. This will give confidence to exporters about what inputs are entering their supply chains. Our second recommendation that builds on the first is to tighten the bill's exclusions relating to certain gene editing techniques. Although we recognize their potential, Many key export markets currently classify organisms derived from these modern gene editing techniques the same as traditional genetically modified organisms. So a minimum level of regulatory oversight is crucial to maintain transparency and visibility of such organisms for exporters. England's recent Precision Breeding Act, for example, liberalised the use of these gene editing techniques, but it does retain clear disclosure requirements to enable industry traceability. And Finally, our third recommendation is to clarify how international regimes are brought into the regulatory framework um, to ensure a New Zealand regulator has clear oversight and accountability for the use and release of gene technologies in New Zealand. So in summary, we believe with these changes, the Gene Technology Bill can enable innovation while ensuring processes and exporters have clarity, transparency, 
and the certainty to re required to manage international market relationships effectively. Thank you. And I think Simon will take questions now. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And uh, that's all we wanted to say in opening, but would welcome questions or comments uh, from the committee. Thank you. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much. We've got five minutes left. I've got questions so far from Mark, Steve and Aisha. We'll go to Mark, who was first on it. Uh, Simon, team, thank you. Um, there's, in your submission and, and many others, there's the alluding to uh, risk to trade and market access. It's a pretty oblique term. Can you, can you put some more detail around that? What does that actually mean in terms of your market risk? Um, thank you <clears throat> uh, for the question. I, I think it's really um, recognising as, as Ben identified that um, in some markets, uh, some gene editing techniques are still considered, they're, they're essentially lumped in with, with all genetic modification and therefore right. require um, uh, a disclosure of, of their presence. So, for example, in, in the European Union, in China, uh, and I think in the Gulf Cooperation Council member states, uh, that that is a requirement. So um, ben, ben may want to comment further, but as I understand it, SDN1 uh, techniques, for example, are lumped together with, with GM. So our view is that we need to be cognizant of these major markets requirements. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of confusing those markets with our, um, our setup, and that would be potentially detrimental to it to our export interests i don't know ben, if you want to supplement that at all yeah just to say you know lots of our markets have different labeling requirements for food products um and so i think we need to know um what's coming into our supply chain uh so that we can understand how mm -hmm. to comply with the food regulations in various different jurisdictions for example do we need to get pre-approval before we can have a certain input going into our supply chain that can feed into that market or um, will we have to put labeling that something is gm um, going into that market and obviously we just need to know what's coming into our supply chain to be able to manage that and ensure that we're complying with um, the various different jurisdictions uh, and i think we've seen across a lot of our um, key markets that um, as I mentioned, gene editing techniques, particularly SDM1, are still treated the same. We are seeing a lot of movement in the space, and that's you know really encouraging that there's... Could, could I just interrupt you because time's yep. very tight? Um, so does that mean you would lose that market, or would that just mean that you would only get access to it at a discount going into the commodity? No, I don't the... think... No, we're not saying we would lose markets. We're saying we need to manage carefully the market requirements that exist so to make sure we meet them for example in the european union um, we would not be able to have uh, milk products dairy products entering the market that are derived from a genetically modified cow without having pre-approval and that labeling as such we'll be able to manage that if we can have visibility of the gene te technologies that are in new zealand Steve Abel. Yeah, and so just for clarity, um, the idea that there wouldn't be regulatory oversight or public disclosure of um, SDN1 is not really tenable. You would expect that uh, the change made to the bill would be to make sure, sure that all of these things are disclosed and there is regulatory oversight. Otherwise, you've got no way to uh, accurately declare what you might be exporting. Probably one That's for you, Ben. Yeah, sorry, I missed the start of that, but I think the answer um, is yes, we would certainly want to see some form of minimum level of uh, disclosure in the regime. Um, it, ultimately, it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. The regulator is going to determine through the risk framework, um, I think, what level of um, oversight is needed. Uh, and we recognise that for a lot of gene editing techniques, it may be that there isn't necessarily the same level of um, requirements that will be imposed as, as some of the more traditional forms of GM. And you you have on, recently marketed... Steve, Steve. On. That was a sub to his one, really. Can I well, have a primary question? I've got a question, too. <laughs> no, go to Dr. Vera. Um, with respect to traceability, then, um, uh, some might say that the burdens of a traceability system should lie on industry and um, 
what we need to know from you is, is that workable for you? Or does, uh, is it really the case that the bill needs to change in order to allow that to happen? Um, I'll probably answer that one. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. I, I think the issue is without notification at all, we, we, we then have the issue that we, we may have to implement systems across our entire supply everywhere in New Zealand, rather than a more targeted approach that we might take with a notification for what changes are being made where. So it, it makes the potential for a traceability system possible, uh, again, with the appropriate guardrails associated with that, without which we, we risk having to do that in a um, essentially New Zealand-wide context, uh, and also without clarity as to um, even what changes we're looking for within um, that context, because it, it won't be declared at all. So um, it, it is... Um, it is somewhat unmanageable without the declarations of what changes have been made and where. So it, it's, I think the upside potential is, is, is quite exciting, but without the ability to know what changes have been made, made where and where it's been introduced, um, I think we, we, we uh, face a particularly challenging environment to manage with our, with our market. And I think... Customers. I think ultimately, it, it, if it is possible, it would come down to significant additional cost and, and probably a lot of duplication of different companies having to establish costly processes, uh, which seems sort of suboptimal to us when we're talking about some of New Zealand's largest food export markets. Thank you very much for that. It's a shame we don't have more time, but um, we are over now. Thank Sorry. you for your submission. Sorry for those who didn't get additional questions. Uh, th thank you to the committee and uh, just to be clear of our ongoing support, we appreciate the work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.